If I would like to uh, hear or read these or other arguments, uh, are there any books that you would uh, recommend that you or others have written? C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity is the best presentation of the case for Christianity that I've ever read. If you want a book of arguments, my handbook of Christian apologetics, actually uh, the chapter on the arguments for the existence of God was written by uh, my co-writer, Father Teselli, who's a better scholar than I am. Uh, Fundamentals of the Faith, published by Ignatius Press, has a summary of most of the main arguments. And look at the classical sources. Look at Aquinas' Five Ways. Look at uh, 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 Paley's Analogy. Uh, any philosophy professor can, can point you to the good texts. Uh, Richard Dawkins, in, his, uh, in a recent article in Scientific American, has argued that uh, observed designs, that he has observed design in living things such as behaviors, but if they were designed, they were designed cruelly and amorally. I think that's a philosophical mistake because amorality and immorality, such as cruelty, are always destructive of design. For instance, when I'm cruel to you, I might do things like hit you. And when I hit you, I disturb the design inherent in your body. For instance, if I take your eye out, I make it impossible for your eye to function. So evil is always destructive of design. So I think it's self-contradictory to say that evil is part of design. It was, uh, it was said or asked in your final argument that living the faith will make you the faith. Perhaps I've misinterpreted your argument or failed to note it correctly, but is living the faith without first believing in it blind faith? No, it's an experiment. It's the Alka-Seltzer commercial. Try it, you'll like it. It's not the best kind of experiment, but it's better than nothing. And it can be very honest. Uh, in a sense, it's a leap in the dark, but not a total leap in the dark. It's like a blind date that somebody persuades you to take on their authority. And you're not sure, but you try it. Basically, these two questions are asking a similar thing. If consciousness or conscience is a proof for a God, then uh, is it a defeater uh, to have psychopathic individuals or people who are morally or mentally unstable? Mm -hmm. Well, by definition, somebody who is so mentally unstable that they can't tell right from wrong uh, are people that you want to cure. They're like people who are blind or uh, lame or uh, sick. Uh, they are not functioning in a completely human way. So we try to cure them. You don't try to cure an oyster for brain damage. An oyster can't do mathematics. So you give it some operation to put the brain back together so that it can? No. But if you have a blow on the head and the gray matter gets messed up and you can't calculate anymore, you go have an operation and they try to cure you. So if somebody's conscience doesn't work, uh, what do you do? Well, you try to educate them. You try to reform them. You try to rehabilitate them. Uh, in other words, you've got to judge from the normal, natural state of the organism rather than from the abnormal and unnatural state. And we all, in practice, uh, treat the person without a conscience as abnormal and unnatural and the person with a conscience as normal and natural. Immanuel Kant writes in the categorical imperative that there is a universal law that binds our conscience and causes us to act in rightness. Uh, how would you respond to this, and is this common law theory attributable to instinct of humankind? 
I think Kant is right that there is a categorical imperative, but his explanation for it is inadequate. It's what he called the autonomy of the will. A law comes from a lawgiver, that is, a will. Uh, which will is this? Kant thought it was our own will rather than the divine will. He called the old theory that morality comes from the divine will the heteronomy of the will. The human will is under the nomos or authority or law of another, a heteros. Whereas he preferred the notion that we are our own lawgiver. Well, the problem with that is if we are our own lawgiver, if we are under a law we made ourselves, why is that law binding? If I invent the rules of a game, then I can dispense myself from the rules of the game by changing them. If I lock myself in a room and keep the key, I'm not really bound. So if I, rather than God, am the author of the moral law, even if I here stand simply for I as an example of humanity at large, then uh, why can't I dispense myself from the law by the same authority with which I bound myself? If someone proved logically that God didn't exist, would you forsake Christianity or have faith that the reasoning was somehow flawed? Besides reason, how do we know God? All right. Those are two different questions. Uh, the first one has a self-contradiction built into it because if someone proved logically that God didn't exist and there's nothing wrong with the proof and there's no ambiguous term and no false premise and no logical fallacy, then they've proved that God doesn't exist. And if you've, they've proved that God doesn't exist validly, then God doesn't exist. And since Christianity teaches that God does exist, Christianity would then be proved to be false. So how could you then have faith that the reasoning was somehow flawed? If, if you prove it logically, that means the reasoning is not flawed. If the reasoning is flawed, then they haven't proved it logically. They've only seemed to. Besides reason, how do we know God? That's a good question in many ways. We know God intuitively. Some of us know God mystically. We know God personally. We know God by ordinary religious experiment, uh, experience in prayer. Some know God by extraordinary religious experience, mystical states. We know God implicitly in everything that we know. One of the arguments for the existence of God is the epistemological argument, the argument from truth. The fallible, finite, changeable, changing human mind is capable of knowing absolute, eternal, certain, unchangeable truth, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. How is that possible? Where are these truths? If they're merely in changing minds, then they must be changing truths. But there are some unchanging truths that we know. Therefore, there must be an unchanging mind. We know God in great art, the Bach argument. Uh, one of the ways I know there is a God is when I surf. Only surfers can understand that. Whether you profess the, quote, Jesus is my Savior, end quote, prayer or not, you are still a part of God. How can a part of God spend eternity in a godless hell? He can't. Uh, I would like to have an interesting ecumenical dialogue with you sometime. Obviously, you are a Hindu rather than a Christian, because a Christian does not believe that we are parts of God, but that we are created by God. Chesterton puts it this way. The God of Oriental religion is like a deity that is endlessly congratulating himself and shaking his own hand. The God of Christianity is like an unselfish deity who, in a strange fit of generosity, cuts off his own left hand so that that hand might, of its own free will, shake hands with him. There's a big difference between pantheism and theism. And therefore, Hindus and Buddhists do not believe in hell. If everything is God, there is no hell. If, on the other hand, God made creatures distinct from himself, which have free will, then there can be a hell. Scratch the doctrine of free will, and underneath it you find the doctrine of the possibility of hell. Why does the existence of God necessitate our worship, obedience, etc.? Could not anger and resentment be valid responses? Sure, if God is the devil, if God is bad, the proper response to, being, to, to badness is anger. If some crooked lawyer gets off the drug dealer that gives drugs to your kid who just took an overdose and died 
And if you are not angry at that crooked lawyer, there's something wrong with your morality. So if God is like a drug dealer or a crooked lawyer, then anger is the correct response. If, on the other hand, he is the source of all goodness, then gratitude and love is the correct response. Augustine once summarized the case for and against God in two sentences. If there is no God, why is there good? If there is God, why is there evil? The answer to the second question is a mirror. An atheist once commented that uh, religious belief in a loving God is folly since religion has been the cause of many wars. Can you comment on this paradox? Religion has not caused wars. Irreligion, professed by people who claimed to believe a religion, has been the cause of war. Every major religion in the world uh, teaches peace and not war. So if a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim uh, starts an aggressive war, he does so contrary to his own religion and his own scriptures. In one of my philosophy class discussions, uh, a lady was arguing that if God is omnibenevolent, why did he create a world full of people in hopes that they worship him and carry out his will? Isn't this conceited or selfish? Also, uh, what about causal laws? Is God bound by them? The first question I find astonishing. If God is omnibenevolent, why did he create a world full of people in hopes that they carry out his will? Isn't that conceited or selfish? That's like saying, if... Professor Kraft, you are a good and unselfish person, then why did you have four children that you have lavished such time and energy and attention and money on all your life? Aren't you conceited or selfish? Very strange thing to say. I don't know what to, how to respond to that. And God is not bound by physical causal laws. He can perform miracles. God is not bound by any law. However, the very nature of God is the source of logical laws. God is consistent with himself, thus the law of identity. God does not contradict himself, therefore the law of non-contradiction. So even God does not, and in a sense cannot, perform a contradiction. However, he can uh, perform miracles because physical causal laws are laws of this possible world, and there are other possible worlds, for instance, one in anti-gravity, uh, in which these physical laws would not apply. But, uh, three more questions here. In, re in uh, relation to Pascal's wager, if you accept God, you limit or bias your perspective. You may lose sight of the real truth if that truth lies elsewhere. That is exactly right. If you accept the truth of any proposition whatsoever... You will limit your perspective. If I believe that I exist, I limit my perspective to believing that it is not true that I do not exist. And if it is true that I do not exist, then I have lost sight of the real truth if that truth lies elsewhere. So all you've done is state the logical law of non-contradiction. Substitute anything whatsoever for God and your sentence remains true. If you accept atheism, you limit or bias your perspective. You may lose sight of the real truth if that truth lies elsewhere. If evil is not a part of design, where does it come from in a world made from design? In one sense, that's an extremely simple question to answer from our own experience. In another sense, that's an extremely difficult question to answer from our own experience. The easy way is we all know where most evil, the worst kind of evil, the evil that does the most harm comes from. Human selfishness. In a world of saints, even though you'd still have volcanoes and hurricanes and maybe even cancers, uh, it would be almost paradise. But then the question is, but why do we do evil rather than good? Why, despite reason, faith, and experience, despite the repeated experiment of many, many times choosing the good rather than the evil and always finding that it makes you happy in the long run. 
And the alternative experiment of constantly choosing evil rather than good and always finding that it makes you miserable in the long run. Why, after millions of days or thousands of days that you began with prayer and found that this caused joy, and thousands of days that you began by omitting prayer and finding that this caused joylessness, Why, after the repeated experiment of verifying the line from Dante that T.S. Eliot says is the profoundest in all of human literature, namely, in God's will, our peace, why do we continue to try uh, the experiment that never works? Why, having put this car, uh, which Christians call sin, on the road and gassed it up, it's never moved a foot? Do we keep pushing it and expecting it to move? Because we're nuts. That's one of the meanings of of the doctrine of original sin. We're morally insane. We're also deeply sane. Uh, There's an old Jewish tradition that says God wanted to reveal himself to the world and he wanted to choose a people and he wanted to choose a leader for this people and he knew that the leader would have to know himself too as well as knowing him. So he first went to a Greek philosopher and said, what is man? The Greek philosopher said, man is sweetness and light. God said, don't call me, I'll call you. Then he went to Attila the Hun and said, what is man? And Attila said, man is a wolf, man is a pair of rapacious jaws. Fine, said God, don't call me, I'll call you. Then he went to Abraham and said, what is man? And Abraham said, oh God, don't call me, I don't know what man is. I seem to be a a thousand different things. I seem to be uh, something like a god and something like a wolf. I seem to be a a jungle of of a hundred hungry animals. I'm all confused. God said, good, you should be my prophet. The little good in the worst of us, the little bad in the best of us. Final question, one related, uh, I think, a little bit to application here. Uh, does this God care what I major in and what I do with my education or a simple belief enough and then do what I please? He wants you to major in himself. He wants you to be educated. The word education means to lead out. In order to major in God, you have to be led out of godlessness. In order to major in light, you have to be led out of darkness. Uh, What particular light, what particular colors of the light you want to major in, Sure, he knows everything, he cares about everything. If he cares how many hairs fall from your head, he cares about whether you major in philosophy or sociology or computers. Uh, But he also cares enough about your freedom that he leaves you in the dark. That is, he lets you do your own homework and make mistakes. The explanation for everything, even evil in the world and the good in the world, is the same. God loves you. Thank you.